Sorry, yes, I'm having spaghetti for breakfast. It's perfect, yum, yum. perfectly acceptable breakfast food. I know, right? Perfectly acceptable. That spaghetti you made, Ben, was super good. I was having it the next day. I'm like, nom, 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 nom. Hello and welcome to Because Language, a podcast about linguistics, the science of language. I'm Daniel Midgley. Let's meet the team. Back from her travels around the world, it's Hedwig Hirgard. Hello. I'm back. You're back in Germany? I'm back in Germany. It's very nice. You're back with your kitties. And as a fellow person who has a kitty, I feel it. I feel how yeah. delight. Like you must have walked in the door and just been like, come to me. Yeah. yeah, it's very <laughs> nice. They're very sweet ones. Were the cats like, oh, it's you? Yeah, sort of. I mean, they're they're cu they're Pretty cuddly. Much. They're a bit cuddlier than usual, but also it's been um, the weather is getting colder, so, so they get cuddlier. Oh, so they're like junk. Like yes, I sleep yep. with you. <laughs> That's very cute. Back from his trip to the other room, possibly past the fridge for a drink on the way there. It's Ben Ainsley. Accurate. Yeah. yeah, you didn't no, come. I've, all that I've way. no feedback to offer. No notes. That's that is a really appropriate thing about my life because there is a triangle between things where I can play video games, things where I can sleep, and things where I can acquire food. That's the holy trinity of everything I actually want in the world. Mm -hmm. It's the real golden triangle. Yeah, yep. yeah. That's my that's my happy zone right there, and somewhere in yeah. that triad. Hey, later on this episode, we're going to be chatting with Dr. Hannah Little about her upcoming book about how science fiction has influenced linguistic research. Like, I actually had a big pull on the way we do things in linguistics. So that's going to be a lot of fun. That is going to be a lot of fun. She's a very funny lady and smart. Well, it's nice to have you all here on the recording, but it was super nice to have you all here at my place to have you, Hedvig, in Perth. Yeah. recently that was so great yeah i was just gonna say that um one of the great things about meeting all of you in the flesh world in perth is also that now when i look at you in zoom and i see your rooms i actually know where you are <laughs> it's not just <laughs> one tiny slice of a disconnected yeah well i mean you always kind of knew where daniel's pantry was though right because we can see 90 percent of where he's in because it's such a small place well now i know like what the kitchen looks like and like the pantry's next to the kitchen. It is surprising how much more central in the house, in the activity zone of the house than you would think it is, yeah. right? Like you would think that he would find like a squirreled away little spot. No, no, dead center. Yeah. Boom. Fridge on one side, oven on the other. Let's go. The hub. And Ben, I really like liked your house as well. And I uh, liked your, your uh, bookcase thing and your sofa's very nice and like, I know where that is. It's nice. Ben made us dinner. Yeah. I made sketty. Yes. Very good. <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't typical spag ball. It was like really elaborate. It was elaborate spaghetti. Mm. I slow roasted cherry tomatoes in a reduction of balsamic vinegar and then mixed that in with a topping of fresh basil and goat cheese. <laughs> yeah, that's very Spaghetti. Good. It was really good. Yeah. Sketty. So, so while Hedvig was here, the three of us made a bonus episode for our patrons. It was us sitting out on a beautiful Sunday morning, no, Monday morning, beautiful Monday morning, talking about the show, talking about uh, ourselves, which you would not think was that interesting. But then, you know, you'd say the same thing about linguistics as well. True. So Wait. if you want to see that episode, what? I mean, none of our listeners would say that about linguistics. I think he meant generally. Okay. I think after watching the episode, I think you won't say that about us either. We're... We're actually quite interesting. Oh. We're quite compelling. Uh. Now, the only problem is we totally recorded that bonus episode as if it was like a great primer for people coming to Because Language. So I don't know if it makes the best sense as like a only for the patrons episode. Well, one thing that people are saying on our Discord is that it just has a really nice vibe. And I I felt that as well. I felt like the it birds. captures sort of the, the birds singing, yeah. us drinking coffee, switching from camera one to camera two every once in a while. Yeah, vibes are good. It was great. So if you want to see that become a patron, you'll be supporting the show, getting goodies besides like bonus episodes, invites to live episodes, our yearly mail out. Ooh, that's coming. And access to our wonderful Discord community. So uh, come on over and sign up. It's patreon.com slash because lang pod. What is going on in the world? It's been like two weeks. Hedvig has like traveled around the world. There has to be some pretty significant update or going on. What have you got for us? 
There have been a lot of interesting stories. This one has been suggested by Pharaoh Cat, who is going to helm an entirely Pharaoh Cat curated show pretty soon. Bonus episode there. Exciting. Daniel Andrews, who's the uh, MP. MP? Is he? I thought he. Okay, this is where my ignorance of Australian politics comes to the fore. I should have looked this up. He's not the premier of Victoria, is he? No, Dan Andrews is the. Yeah, no, he is. Uh, I'm going to quickly double check that, but I'm 95% sure he is. But his his Twitter handle is yep. Daniel Andrews MP. Premier of Victoria. Well, he's still a member of parliament. He's still a he member is, of parliament. Okay. Yeah. We don't have a handy two letter abbreviation for premiers. So things I should know. So he tweeted this a reelected Labour government will redevelop and expand Marunda Hospital from the ground up. It will be renamed in honor of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth Boo. II. Sorry, I didn't even need you to get to the end. That is such a massive boo. Oh, uh, I, I don't have any feel. I, I try not to have feelings about sports and royals. You know, no, you should have feelings should, about royals. They're bad. We don't need royals. I, I not, just want a republic. I'm a republican, I feel, definitely. I feel I like this is not a particularly like. I mean, I know it feels like it is at the moment because everyone. Like in Australia, for those of you who are listening outside of Australia, when the Queen's funeral happened, it was simulcast on every terrestrial mm. broadcast station. And I'm not joking. Like you could flip through the entire catalogue of Australian TV channels and it was on every single one. Admittedly, there's five. So, you know, yeah. it's, not, mm. it's not like <laughs> 36 cable channels or whatever, but still. No. And so I realised that it's probably like, it seems like a kind of take, I guess, but like, no, massive boo. We don't need to name staff after the royal family of a different country. That's Anymore. I yeah. By the way, Hedvig, we had a discussion once about <clears throat> Prince Char King Charles. Now, <laughs> I thought that once he, uh, once he was in power, that people would go, you know what? Time to end this royal stuff. But you thought that people would say in Australia, no, nah, let's give him a chance, see what he does. Um, ben, are you noticing either of those two sentiments in your circles? I don't see much interest or care about King Charles III. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I saw a lot of like end of an era, oh, my God, this is so huge, blah, 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 blah. I think a lot more Fair. people cared about the ending of a thing yeah. than they do about the beginning of a thing. And also because mm. she represented... Mm. I, I was listening to the Swedish political commentary. A young Tan Unge was saying, like, she represented the end of an era and the end of, like, the idea of Britain as an empire. And that maybe now they can shed the fake idea that they're still an empire and just be, like, a European country uh, and, like, get on with life. Like, lots of European countries have kings and queens. And import and export and, you know, former colonies and current colonies and like Britain can just like step down and stop pretending, uh, which maybe is nice. <laughs> to, like, I don't know, man. Mm. I got to be honest, mm. given given who's in charge of Britain at the moment, I'm not thinking that's coming down the pipe anytime soon. Mm. No, and I, I mean, I, I think we should. I don't mean King Charles, by the way. I mean, their prime minister. Yeah. Yeah. No, I understand that. Um. I feel like it's worth acknowledging that like a lot of people really liked the queen and were very sad when she died. But what we're having discussions about now is like the royalty as an institution and not the person. And also she's already passed and naming a hospital in Perth, right? After No, somewhere uh, Victoria. No, um, oh, Victoria. Who in Melbourne, right? Yeah, but but mm. this is this is a good point though, Hedvig. I'm glad you mentioned that. Because we have one of those already in Western Australia. We have the Queen Elizabeth II health campus right. it's like our third biggest hospital you don't need another one and we've got like like we've got elizabeth key we've got so much shit named after this lady we don't need more and uh, mm. can i ask mm. is marunda hospital in a suburb called marunda yes and the name because that sounds like a good name <laughs> like, like it's a warrior -ung name it means leaf which according to the Marunda website says it symbolizes Marunda's green environment. So it means leaf in Woyorong. If they're in a suburb called Marunda or a city called Marunda and they're the Marunda hospital, then like, if you now become the Queen Elizabeth II hospital, how many of those do we have in the world? Yeah, like mm. the, the, the Googleability of that is very bad. Very bad. I agree with you. I don't think it's the most significant thing. I think the most significant thing is beyond simply, oh, end of an era and all this kind of stuff. Like the, 
the crown doesn't represent good things, um, right? Like mm, it's not mm. an institution and I'm not even much of a Republican in the sense that like I desperately want Australia to be a republic. Like I don't really have any baseline issues with how the actual system of government functions in Australia, but it just so happens that there's this weird archaic Thing, this vestigial feature, this this weird this, fondness, like this whale hips of a thing politically sitting there that we just need to get rid of. It just doesn't. Yeah, yeah, it's silly. yeah. It, especially when it displaces Aboriginal naming. You know, we we can't just say that if uh, you name something, if you give something uh, an Aboriginal name, that you're done. But boy, oh boy, symbolism matters, and this is the optics on this are just atrocious. It's particularly interesting for a Labor government as well. I could see a mm, Liberal yeah. government doing this any day of the week, right? Like a like a Conservative mm. politician dog whistling to their, like, base. This, yeah, it's a weird move for a Labor dude. Yeah, who matters? You know, who's this about? Mm. So Jack Lattimore of The Age writes that uh, Indigenous leaders complained and the Premier doubled down. Oh, good. He said... They, that is the indigenous leaders, the assembly, they are elected to negotiate treaties. That's what they need to do. That's what they're elected to do. And we're delivering that treaty. So in other words, just shut up and stick to doing your job. Weird move. Yeah, this is a bizarre, weird. I feel like bizarre when move. I think that something is that weird, I'm missing some information. Like there's something else going on here. There's some sort of dog whistling or something in that electorate yeah. or something that I don't know about because like, I it looks weird. I agree. Weird. I feel like he's he's had someone in his ear, some apparatchik who's gone, we've run the numbers and there's this like swing voter block who you really need to get on side or something like that because yeah. this is just such a bizarre, bizarre thing to do. And it, I'm sure it has something to do with the time, you know, the timing matters on oh, this sure like she just died like mm. it's it's in everyone's like if this happened eight years from now it would be really really weird well thanks farrah for helping us shine a light on that we'll keep an eye on this issue as we do with names and naming hedvig you brought us a story about plain language in new zealand Yes, yeah, so there's a discussion in New Zealand about a plain language bill. So these happen all over the world regularly where governments are like, our bureaucracy is too complicated. We need to simplify it so that people understand the information we are distributing to them. And mm. um, in New Zealand, they're discussing uh, such a thing. And some people are saying that this is a waste of resources. We, It's already plain enough. And they're going back and forth. And I think... I mean, so it's interesting in the case of New Zealand, but I thought of it as an addition to our show also because I think it's a movement in many places. I don't know if Australia has had like a official plain language movement in bureaucracy, but like a lot of other countries have and it's generally good stuff. Now, when we say in bureaucracy, what, because bureaucracy is a relatively nebulous term, right? Do we mean legal jargon yeah. in, in most instances is going to be uncomplicated because that seems like a pretty impossible task if you've ever spoken to a lawyer in a professional sense. No, it can be done. It can be done. But in this act, I took a look at the wording. It looks like it's not very well defined. Uh, okay. Here's the wording. In this act, plain language means language that is A, appropriate to the intended audience and B, clear, concise and well organized, which sounds great, right? But what does that mean operationally? Okay. Wait, hang on though appropriate to the intended audience like yeah you could well, you could get away with a lot that way right <laughs> do you want to hear examples yes okay okay so in the garden article they have a couple of examples because they have a plain language uh best sentence transformation award so the sentence where it has mm -hmm. been identified <laughs> and it is possible to update this it has been undertaken ensuring future band allocation is correct this is from the new zealand transport authority band allocation and the good version of that? And that has been made into, where possible, we've identified and updated affected submodules to make sure they're assigned to the correct levy band going forward. Now, I think the interesting thing in that example, because I'm looking at it word for word here, they haven't actually simplified it in a vocabulary sense, right? No. So this is all about grammar. Uh, yeah, so some... Like, the the first passage was just horrendously written. <laughs> yeah, no, so some of them, the other longer one, 
I like this one, the first sentence for the other one. So this is the government stats department. Over the year, we tested the innovation readiness and change adaptability of the organization. And that became, we tested how ready our organization was to innovate and make changes. Yeah, that I'll pay that. That is better. That's totally. Sounds pretty good. It's, it sounds, it's so interesting. They basically, you could call this a Grammarly bill, essentially. <laughs> like, like they're going to feed all of their copy into this thing and Grammarly is going to go through it and be like, hmm, this sounds a bit clunky and difficult. Perhaps condense it to this. <laughs> There's two ways that I go about this. One part of this annoys me because I talk to a lot of people about language and I get a lot of complaints about the way politicians talk. Right? It's a generic sort of complaint. People want to complain about the way politicians talk. They don't want to analyze how they talk or see why they're talking the way they do. They just don't like politicians or, you know, the generic politician that they imagine. So this really feeds right into a kind of complaint culture that people are really happy to sign on to. Mm. Um, on the other hand, there's a real need to have writing be comprehensible and check out part 72A, link on our website because language.com. It says the guidance, the, the writing, must include guidance to support the accessibility of relevant documents, including the accessibility of those documents to people with disabilities, to which I'm like, yes, yeah, make sure that part's in there. I will. I, I, I agree with a level of like from based on the examples that we just read all for it. Go for it. Fantastic. Because the, the writing isn't so difficult that people without a good education can't access it, although that is potentially happening, right? Mm. I think the writing is so dry and boring, even people with the necessary education are not going to slog through it because it's just so potentially deliberately. I would argue this is the result of overworked governmental employees banging a thing out and going basically like, what's the minimum amount I need to do to make this publishable? Okay, that's what I'll do. I've done it. Um, and so I don't think people are, I, don't, I agree with you, Daniel. I don't think this is a deliberate like collusion of politicians who are like, I'm going to make it so difficult to read that no one will understand. I think that is happening, just not deliberately. Yeah. I think it's happening through a combination of like laziness and low resources. And so- because of that, I do think people aren't as armed when it comes to like going toe to toe with their government as they could be. Because when someone goes, "Oh, we'll just look at the statutes," and then you you blow the dust off this tome from like the state library and you open it up and like ghosts fly out, and then you read this just biblically boring text and you give up, right? So if they can make something that's plain, uh, that will give the average citizen the ability to arm themselves well, so that if a person a roadblock in the system is like oh well that's not how we do that they can go well actually i've read it and it very clearly says that you can do this so could you please do yeah, it yeah it's an equity and fairness issue and i think what we're talking about is also uh plain language in communication from the government to its citizens not necessarily for example the law book uh, you know i i mean when it comes mm. to the law it is a certain way and changing that is like a bigger task than what i think this is about and i mean i believe that a lawyer education is essentially a very complicated interpretation education. <laughs> it is. Spicy take. I it's love like it. They I learn it. lawyerese <laughs> yeah. and then mm. they try and transmit that knowledge to someone else. That's like. My favorite phrase for this. They are jargonauts. Yeah. Jargonauts. Mm. And like we need them and that's, that's what they do. But, and. Um, but yeah, no, I think this is this is fundamentally a good thing, very good thing. People are very suspicious of jargon because they think it's trying to keep them out. But linguists have jargon. We use it when we're trying to describe stuff that we do, and they people think there's some kind of spurious motive. But I don't see this as trying to make things more comprehensible. At least not the examples that we've seen. I see it as people picking up on jargon because they just hate it and they're complaining about it. Whenever I but see ja people but complaining is, about jargon, I didn't see, like, I didn't see oh, jargon no. being fixed here. Did you? I didn't see any jargon being removed. The words yeah. mostly are the same. They've just made it more readable and less baffling. And also jargon has a purpose. So like when linguists talk to other linguists, jargon mm. is a shorthand and you know you're talking to other linguists. But that's yeah, the point. Totally. You need Precisely. to know who your audience is. And when bureaucrats make mm -hmm. texts and 
write it as if they're writing to other bureaucrats and not take into account that their audience isn't other bureaucrats, it's random citizens, then you get problems. Jargon is great, but it's good for intra-group communication. And these things aren't yeah. mm -hmm. intra-group communication. That's that's the issue. Yeah. They're inter-group communications. If it can be done well, then that's great. Um, this law won't teach people to write better or more comprehensibly. And that needs to happen, definitely. It is in part a social justice issue. I look at this and I see this feeding into complaint culture, which is annoying, but maybe an unavoidable side effect. I think people should complain when they don't understand what their government is saying to them. Yes, I agree. I, I think they should switch the rule that the West Australian has, the, the one newspaper we have in Perth, right? Their mm. style guide is you cannot write an article pitched higher than a year 10 level education, mm. right? And I don't think that that is an appropriate rule for the one newspaper because we need a higher level of discourse <laughs> in the one yeah. newspaper we have, right? Like it, we can't glass ceiling it there. I feel like we should switch it. We should just go, okay, take the West Australian style guide, give it to the bureaucrats, right? No one under a year 10 education can understand your shit. Then you don't get to write your shit. And then to the West Australian be like, a little bit more, please. Just, just a little bit more, please. <laughs> There was one really interesting thing about this that I caught. This this was from the article by Tess McClure in The Guardian. Do you know how people say that they're using the passive voice when they're trying to evade responsibility? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you can do that. You can say, mistakes were made, not by me. But a lot of people, including journalists, refer to any time somebody is trying to make an action seem agentless, they just call it the passive voice, even when the passive voice isn't being used. So saying, the suspect was shot is passive voice and saying a shooting occurred is not passive voice, but they both make the shooting seem like no one did it, and everyone calls them both the passive voice. I think that's okay. Pas you think just calling them both the passive voice is no big deal? Yeah. I mean, it, grammatically it's wrong, but in the popular understanding, yeah. what people mean by passive voice is changing, right? Yeah, I think it's okay. Sometimes there's a feeling that we need to have a different term for it besides passive voice. Just if we can, if we can flip a switch and get people on a different track to, to call it something else, not passive voice. Maybe we agree better. This article makes reference to what someone calls the past exonerative tense. No, hate it. Which is interesting. <laughs> I like that. I hate it. I do too. I like passive um, voice. You like passive voice. Yeah, I think it, it pertains to the, like, it, it describes actions as just occurring, like everyone is passive. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the popular mm -hmm. mind, I think the word voice signifies like a standpoint. Um, so like, yep. I like grammar and I know that voice is like diatheses and blah, blah, blah. But I think passive voice is great. Yep. I don't think reinventing the wheel is not always a good thing. It's actually an aspect, isn't it? Passive voice? Well, passive voice in the grammatical sense is a voice, but this exonerative usage seems more like an aspect to me. Aspect is about think? the internal temporal organization of something. It's, it's really tiny. So it's like whether an action is completed or reoccurring or every Thursday or is finished or ongoing. That's mm. aspecty things. Mm. Okay, not an aspect. So, How about if we call it weasel voice? This could be <laughs> epistemicity, like the stance of the speaker. Mm -hmm. But I was going to say stance. You could say agentless stance, but nobody's going to go for no, that. No, passive voice is, passive voice is great. You like passive voice. Yeah. I, w I can accept that because I know that language changes and people will have, there will be different <laughs> senses for the same term. I would like to call it weasel voice because everyone knows voice. I, I'm going to back away from weasel voice simply because in this yeah. instance, yeah, it can be used to like sort of remove one's agency from the process. But there are valid instances in journalism where you have to do that, right? Like, so if you're yeah. reporting under things that are under like a judge, you you have to use passive voice because you can't actually make it seem like anyone has done anything. So like passive voice is like a necessary thing. And so calling it weasel voice <laughs> feels, I don't know, <laughs> you don't like a little bit. Okay. Oh yeah, this article about a person who was accused of murder who later got off because they didn't do it was just totally written in weasel voice. It feels like you're, um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Passive voice it is. We're just going to have to accept that there's different, there's a popular understanding of passive voice and then there's a grammatical understanding of passive voice. I mean, that's already- okay. There's lots of things like yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, agent, subject, topic, yep. mood. Yep. <laughs> like, it's fine. Whoa, whoa. What do you mean? <laughs> what? Mood? What? Mood can't mean more than one thing, surely. Uh, no. Nah. Go back. Yeah. Go back. I don't yeah. want to know. 
Pull out, pull out. Yeah, I'm, I'm ripcording that one for sure. Okay, let's move on. This one was suggested by Aristemo. We remember Bodie McBoatface, don't we? Uh, yeah. I liked it at the time, and then, wow, it really died the slowest and really most aged, painful of it? deaths. I really yeah. liked it. I, oh. I was in Liverpool, and it was dark there, and like we were doing a little boat tour, and they were like, oh, here's like this old building. And, and then the guide accidentally said, oh, and like in that corner, you can kind of see Bodie McBoatface. And everyone was like, where? What? <gasps> Bodie McBoatface? <laughs> like a celebrity. You mean yeah. the David Copperfield Express? Yeah. Um. So... What do we have to name? Because we have done quite a few of these stories. I know what's coming. We have, we have to name something new now, right? We have to name something new. NASA has asked Twitter users to name the probe to Uranus. Oh, the Uranus yes. Orbiter and Probe Mission. Okay. So, so many, here we so go. much butt stuff coming up. Butt stuff is enjoyable. So um, one user said Proby McProbe face, naturally. Mm. Another operation butt plug. Someone else responds, this seems like the perfect time for Astroglide to sponsor space exploration. Or the Planetary Orbital Observation Probe, aka the poop. Okay. Well I like I kinda like poop because it's acronym sorry, it's initial no acronym, because it is an acronym, right? Because we're saying it. It's not an initialism. It's abbreviation. Um, Nobody cares about the difference between initialisms and acronyms anymore. Okay. So um, I like that it actually means a very good thing. Like that's the fun mm. thing about dirty acronyms, I reckon, is if you can make them, they're not fun if they don't quite work. They're only fun if they really, really, really definitely work. Poop works. Poop works Poop's really good. well. Planetary yeah. Orbital Observation Platform? Yeah. I have almost? already forgotten. And I'm no, it's Planetary Orbital Observation Probe. See, probe. I've already <laughs> forgotten what it really was, and it's poop. It's Fantastic. just poop to me now. I'm I'm mm. I'm team poop. I'm team poop. Team as poop. Well. Yeah, it's good. We are team poop. Yes. Yeah. Now I have a suggestion for the planet Uranus. While I'm being the guy who wants to change everything and getting voted down, I'm prepared to <laughs> nominate something else to change, and I will get voted down. Okay. Instead of calling the planet Uranus, boo! I'm already against it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Sorry. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> Go on. Give us your terrible idea. Let me shoot it down properly. Can I suggest that we call it by its Hindi name, Varuna? That's the Sanskrit Ooh. equivalent. Varuna was the god of the water and the celestial ocean, as well as a god of law of the underwater world. It's about time we had a Hindu deity in the names for planets. Yeah. I got it. I, I hate this less. I got to be honest. I do. Yeah, like you're, you're winning me over. It would stop a lot of snickering in, uh, in astronomy class. And if we do change it to Varuna, then here's the mnemonic. My very educated mother just served vegan nachos. And... Who doesn't love vegan nachos? What is it currently? I don't know any of the mnemonics for the planets. Well, when I was a kid, it was my very educated mother just served us nine pizza pies, but then Pluto got demoted. So I guess served us nachos. Served, yeah, served us Nothing nachos, yet. but now she served vegan nachos. Although I don't mind the cheese. I like Varuna. I'm, I'm on board. I like it. So, really? wait. Yep. I'm astounded. Really? Well, because what? it's non-Western, right? Like we've named everything after like Western shit and mm -hmm. why not i have a question western poop. so yes. uranus i looked it up is uh, so the latin equivalent is uh Calus, and it's the god of the sky and you just said the mm -hmm. uh varuna was the god of water oh i said it was the sanskrit equivalent didn't i okay i'm not certain that that is true let me just change that it is sanskrit and it might be a totally different god, but I'm okay with that. Yeah, I was just... Because normally when you flip, like, you take another sky god. Hold oh. on. Wait a minute. Having a look. If that's, if that's the case, if I've just suggested Varuna, the god of the water, then that means we've actually got two Neptunes, right? Yeah. Hmm. So, hmm. Uh, hmm. uh... Indra. Indra would be the Hindu god of the sky, according to my single Google. Uh, well, then let's do that. Indra. Yeah. Indra's nice. Sky, lightning, weather, thunderstorms, rain, river flows, and war. I mean, if we, oh, yeah. if they're always and war. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all, all the gods, not just Hindu because gods. Because Uranus. <laughs> essentially. Um, yeah. yeah. But I mean, if, if that's something we care about, like, does it need to, like, keep its semantics? But, I mean, Indra sounds fine as well. I don't know. Maybe we don't. Mm, I like them both. Okay, okay, we'll have a Twitter poll and we'll report on that for our next bonus but episode. I do think that the reason, like, stop sniggering in astronomy class 
I don't agree with the premise that that's a dumb reason. That is what we need <laughs> to do. <laughs> that sounds like it's just bringing we joy need to people. Snickering. Yeah. yeah. Also, yeah, my husband right. may or we may not have written a comedy song related to this. Oh, yeah. oh what a cut up! So can't really throw him under the bus. Well, just get him to learn Sanskrit, and then he can do a hilarious, like I don't know, like a ribald um, series of japes about it in Sanskrit, and it'll be great. Yeah, see, doing a, doing puns on Uranus is really easy, but and everyone's done them. But yeah. you know, Varuna or Indra, you know, this is new territory. We could uh, make a song about that. <laughs> and now it's time for the Oxford game, or as we call it, yeah, nah, or nah, yeah. I give you two words, and you have to tell me if they're related or if the similarity between them is merely coincidental. Our etymological information, as always, comes straight from our sponsors, the Oxford English Dictionary, the definitive record of the English language. The Thinking Person's Dictionary. You sound pensive when you say that. Wow. Well, Good I was reading, about to ben. say the Thinking Man's Dictionary. I was like, well, that is not an appropriate thing to say anymore. Mm -hmm. Our patrons on Discord are having lots of fun proposing their own pairs of words. This has turned out to be a very popular game on our Discord. Ooh. Ooh, good, 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 good. And look, less work for you. Win-win. Mm, well, I, I had a question about this one in my mind. As always, I, I wonder these things throughout the day and think, oh, that'd be a good one. Let's look it up. Sometimes it's a yeah, nah. Sometimes it's a yeah, nah. Y nah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, nah. Yeah, so nah. this one. <laughs> yeah. This one, this iteration of the Oxford game is about a single word with two senses, and the word is toast. One is proposing a toast, uh, and the other is hot buttered toast. Are they related uh, or are they not? Oh no! Mm. Mm. Thoughts? Nah. Yeah. Ben thinks perhaps they are related. Yeah. What? What's your thinking? I have the vaguest, vaguest of memories of some kind of habit or custom from a long time ago that involved dinner tables and people holding up pieces of bread. Mm -hmm. I can't remember where I remember this from. I could be completely mistaken and manufacturing this out of thin fucking air. But I seem to recall some sort of thing where people, like the, the bread of the table was used yep. in some kind of custom or cultural practice. So they held it up in the air. Yeah, like like holding it up in the air or people stopping and listening, something like mm -hmm. that. And they said, I propose toast. And no, then they I all don't said, I don't think I don't think that ever happened. I think this what is happened stupid. was there was, a, something. there was a slight similarity and somehow it, it crossed over. That's okay, my Okay, so Ben that's my thinking. Ben thinks that maybe, yeah. Hedvig, what do you think? Toast toast. Um uh, Well, so so like the the verb to toast as in like Oh, I'm toasting the croutons or something like that. Like means to like apply heat, yes. right? And then there's the like what we call the object nominalization, the toast that the bread the, the bread that mm -hmm. is from the action of doing that. So what I'm now thinking is there's three things. There's the verb to apply heat, there's the verb to do a cheers, and there's the verb there's a noun, the bread. Um, but I think Ben is right that the connection is between the bread and the action of doing it. I know, I, I yeah, 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 nah, yeah. Okay, you both think that they are related. By the way, I love the verb to cheers. We were cheersing all night long. Yeah. I just think that's fantastic. <laughs> Do a cheer. It's great. It's not very often that uh, interjections become verbs. Anyway, uh -huh. here we go. Uh, the correct answer from the Oxford English Dictionary you're both correct. They are related. Okay. Now tell us how. Ah, oh, this is fun. So the hot bread sense comes from about the 1400s, toasting bread. And then the to your health sense, the Oxford English Dictionary says that it is a figurative application of toast. That is to say, a person. You know how we say that somebody is the toast of the town or the toast of the ball? Oh, like toast is a good thing. Yeah, because if somebody is the toast, uh, the Oxford, the OED says that this is like a lady being supposed to flavor a bumper. Oh, I need to explain that word. So a bumper. Oh, Jesus, this is going deep. Okay. It's, it's going deep. A bumper is a drink, an alcoholic drink filled to the brim like for a toast. Okay. And let's just say a lady flavors a party just like toast 
flavors your drink. You see, believe it or not, wait, people wait, used wait. to <laughs> toast flavors drink. Yes. Now, okay. Here's the link. People used to combine their beer or their ale with hot bread. You'd have some beer or some ale, and you would stick a piece of toast in there because who doesn't love crumbs in their drink? Oh, <laughs> not nice. <laughs> this is jellied eel shit. I'm not on board. <laughs> so already there's toast in your drink. All right. Mm -hmm. You get a piece of hot bread sticking in your drink. And when people would have this drink with their toast in it, they would stand around with these cups of soggy bread and they would make long speeches. So you might make a long speech to a lady about how beautiful she was and you'd be toasting her because your she whole, would be the right. toast in that party. She was making the party good, just like your toast makes the drink good. So she's the toast. That is a fucked up and bizarre connection. This is so much weirder than I yeah. ever would have thought. So then the meaning jumped from the piece of toast that you stick in your drink to the lady who is like the toast. And then it jumped again to the act of holding up a drink. They are wow. related. And by the way, toasting has another sense in Jamaican music. You're aware of this one? No. Nope. nope. Oh, toasting is like a rap that you do in the middle of a song. Yeah. And that's related too, because it's related. It gets its meaning from that long speech that you would make to a lady while you're holding up your salty oh, bread in, okay. a, in a cup. Right. Nice. So that's the relationship we call toasting toast because people used to stick toast in their drink. They are related. So go. there is a custom in Scandinavian countries of dipping bread into broth or the juices from steak. Oh, sure. Yes. Like, I don't think that's just Scandinavian countries, right? Like, and I just looked it up and apparently that's called SOP. SOP, S-O-P, that's right. In English, yeah. And that is where we get the word supper from. Right. Oh, to sup up your right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we call yeah, another yeah. word for Christmas is the dipping day. Really? Because that is the day that you do the thing. And then we right. just count. Is that like okay. an archaic word or do you guys regularly say well, that to each other? people still say that. And like the day before Christmas is the day before the dipping day. And the day before that is the day before the right. day before the dipping day. And people can like... Dipping Day Eve? <laughs> Would that be the... Dan för doppare dan is like a saying. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, but that's fantastic. It's always beer. good when the actual Swedish gets busted out because it really does sound a lot like the Swedish chef to people who don't speak Swedish. And, and while we're speaking Stop of it. medieval liquids, I was <laughs> yes. listening to a documentary on YouTube uh, about uh, sex in medieval times. And mm -hmm. I learned that there is a connection, maybe Daniel can uh, look it up if it's actually true, between broth and brothel. <gasps> That's oh next my week's. Gosh. That's next week's. Well, okay. so I heard that it Do is it. true, and I'm pretty sure that it is, so I don't know if it can be a quiz, okay. because it would only be if Ben is convinced by me. <laughs> hey, look, I'm skeptical AF of a lot of the shit you say, so okay. I'm I'm going to go with, yeah. Okay. Let's let's do Broth, it. Brothel. Also, YouTube documentaries very, very significantly in their like oh, yeah. rigor, and like some of them are like the greatest things I've ever seen, and some of them I'm like, oof, you really can just be anyone and upload a thing, can't but you? But this was by a really good uh, medieval historian going medieval on Twitter, who's I respect. She is okay. a PhD in it. Okay. By the way, Ben, we had a talk a while ago about fanging it, and we thought that maybe because fang meant to hang on to something. That when you fang it, you have to hang on, and that's why it's called fanging it. Yep. But apparently it's not. It's somebody's name. It's okay. uh, possibly a race car driver, Juan Miguel Fangio. Oh, there we go. And I learned that because I found it in the OED. There's just so much information in the Oxford English Dictionary. Check your institution, check your local library to see if they have access online, or become a subscriber yourself. Head to our website to see how you could do that. If you go to our website and click through, they'll know it's from us. But the Oxford English Dictionary, sponsors of the show, and the definitive record of the English language. Thanks to them for being sponsors of the show. You can play your own little game of yeah, nah, or nah, yeah, because you can think to yourself, I wonder if those things are related. And then you can go to the place where the Oxford English Dictionary is, possibly even your own very home, and be like, holy shitballs, they are related. Yep. Or they're not. Yeah. Or not. No.
All right, we are here with Dr. Hannah Little. Hannah, thanks for coming on the show and talking to us today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's so fun to have you on because we share a lot of interest in common. Not only have we met a few times, and I would like to call us friends, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yes, we're That's friends. a bit presumptuous, Hedwig. <laughs> And I like you, but I also know that you're into stand-up and comedy and sci-fi and cool things and linguistics and all these things at once. So it's really fun to have you on. All these things at once is my favorite thing. (laughs) And uh, you're working on a book, are you not? I am, yes. Yeah. Very close to 50,000 words now. That's almost a book, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, it is. How how long does the book have to be to... Um, who, who says it needs to be a certain length? Well, I think publishers say that it needs to be a certain length, but um, I think non-fiction books are typically around fifty to 65,000. Um, but the thing is, is that I'm nearly at 50,000, but I'm, I'm nowhere near finished. So there mm-hmm. might need to be quite a substantial amount of editing happening at some point. Oh, oh that's hard. Right. All right. So what's this book about? It's about science fiction and linguistics, um, but specifically it's about all of the ways that science fiction has influenced linguistic research. Um, because quite mm. often when you say sci-fi and linguistics, people think about conlanging, so constructed languages, things like Klingon, um, Navi from Avatar, um, and all the ones from Games of Thrones. Um, sure. But people, uh, there's a lot of examples of where science fiction stories have directly influenced empirical research that's been happening in in linguistics, especially over the last 10, 20 years. I have never heard of this. I'm going to need some examples here. (laughs) Yeah, because usually we hear of the opposite, like linguists working as consultants for sci-fi TV shows or something. But you're saying that the sci-fi authors are having an effect on linguistics. Uh, Yeah, so I think... um, I mean, this happens, I I can't, I've lost count of the number of times I've been at a linguistics conference and somebody started with an example from science fiction, whether that's mm. people, uh, well, sometimes it's look at this example and how horrific it is as a representation. Uh, the thing that springs directly to mind is um, there's a Next Generation episode, Star Trek Next Generation episode called oh, yeah. um, Loud as a Whisper which was one of the earliest representations of American Sign Language on screen. Ooh, I think I know which one it is. But the whole episode cuts out most of the sign language. Yes. And the way that they talk about sign languages uh, within the episode is uh, really bad because they're all acting as if they've never heard of such a thing as a sign language before, despite the majority of the Enterprise being from Earth that uh, you know famously has quite a lot of them. Oh no, yes. how, abs- how exotic, how obscure. Maybe, maybe like I could accept like that no Klingons or Romulans or whatever, that there are no deaf Klingons. Like, I don't know, like fine, whatever, maybe they, but you're right. The Federation is primarily an earth humanoid human thing. So they should be aware of that. Yeah. Mm. And they have really advanced translation technologies on the Enterprise. They have the Universal Translator that can't deal with sign languages. And you would have thought that the linguists who developed that would have thought at some point, oh, there's a whole class of languages on Earth. Maybe some aliens out there might use visual forms of communication and not just have um, spoken language. It's in the update. Do you think that implies that in the, within the Star Trek Federation world, that there are no deaf people, that people get cochlear implant when they're born that are super duper accurate or or do you think yeah well um, they forgot yeah they forgot so there's lots of examples in star trek where they uh yeah within the the world of one episode uh, it contradicts itself several series later um yeah. so i wouldn't like to say what current kind of star trek discovery world would would how that would represent deaf individuals but certainly within that that episode that was the implication Mm. but there's been some really lovely representations of deaf sign language users recently in sci-fi there's a character in the eternals and also one in hawkeye uh marvel's hawkeye if people have seen that Mm. although i have a gripe with eternals which is that one of the eternals is is deaf and uses american sign language but there's scenes that are from like 5000 bc 
where she's using American Sign Language, which is only really 200 years old. Mm. And, but yeah. also they're using spoken American English, which I don't think they had yeah. in 5000 yeah. BC. Um, yeah, yeah, that's the same enough. problem. <laughs> At least that's but, the same problem, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that is me being a, a pedant. But we have gone <laughs> off what the original question was, which was uh, examples <laughs> of how science fiction's influenced linguistic thinking. So my PhD is actually in evolutionary linguistics. So how our ancestors first started to negotiate communication systems and went from a, a status of having no language to having language. Aliens. Aliens. <laughs> well, there, <laughs> I had to. Sorry. There is, exa- um, there is uh, theories that it was aliens uh, and also theories that it was magic mushrooms. Um, oh, I've heard that one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, that, there's also theories that magic mushrooms are the origin of religion. Ooh. Is it the same guy, Terence McKenna, who's... I don't know, but it's the idea that, like, psychedelic substances in nature give people out-of-body experiences, and that's mm-hmm. how they start thinking about, like, the beyond. Anyway. Didn't say a word, but then once you get some shrooms into him, suddenly they can't shut up. I've heard it and heard it. <laughs> <laughs> But one thing that a lot of experimental work in evolutionary linguistics does is use what what I'd call first contact scenarios. So the idea is that you've landed on an alien planet, you need to communicate with these aliens. How do you go about doing it? Because that's very, very similar to the scenario of you are um, a humanoid ancestor who doesn't have language and you want to work out how to communicate with these other people that don't have language. It's not a perfect metaphor because the aliens mm. potentially have language and I have language if I go and land yeah. on an alien planet. And the humans, the first humans might share things that aren't language with each other. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. Yes, which makes it very, e- which makes things like Iconicity very easy because you can iconically represent things via gesture or even vocalizations to communicate something if you know you have that. You can imitate the thing that you're trying to communicate. Yeah. 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 But the thing that's nice about the alien example is that if you are in a situation where you don't have a very rich awareness of the shared knowledge between you and the shared linguistic apparatus and even notions of what a language looks like or what a language should be, you start kind of going back to first principles in terms of, right, what do you need to build that communication? And then that leads us into a space where we can start thinking about what's possible. Mm. And a lot of evolutionary linguistics, because language doesn't fossilize, so we've got written languages for a few thousand years, but before that, we've got very little idea of, of what came came before because because it doesn't fossilize. Yeah, yeah. It's very speculative, right? A lot of it's modeling, mm-hmm computational modeling or experimental modeling and it's just right what's the most likely scenario that we have about how these how we came from point x of no language to point uh y of language and Mm. what's going to happen next what's point z yeah people love to ask that yeah we were interviewed me and daniel um by um this translating agency and they were Uh asking us like as linguists what do you think is going to happen next in language change and we're like, fuck we now. <laughs> yeah, so Hannah, you know. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, you've done this. <laughs> um, but sci- science fiction lo- um, authors love to ask this question. What's mm. next? Where are we going next? What are they saying? Well, in Universal Translate is the big one that comes to mind that, that there's been a lot of work trying to crack that. Um, and translation mm. technologies that we currently have are pretty good four languages that we have a lot of data for. But of course, the vast majority of languages on Earth don't have a lot of data just hanging out on the internet. I think I was reading an article earlier that that said that it was like of the 110 languages spoken on Facebook, and I was like, that's such a tiny proportion of the the Mm -hmm. languages on Earth. Yeah, 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 for sure. I know they're the languages that Facebook are are bothered about, Mm. but we're getting more and more towards systems that can reliably translate languages with less and less data, right? Which is really exciting. The whole zero shot, no training translation. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Which is what you see in Star Trek, right? With the universal translator. They come across a new alien species and somehow 
the translator just can can tackle it unless it's a it's a signed language as we've already oh, discussed uh, not then or yeah. the metaphor. yeah yeah the metaphor Darmuk people and or, yeah Talad, or the, Talad at Niagara, yeah it filled on the Temerian stuff so i have a question about the universal translator and about yeah. what you just said I've got a lot because of so i was a friend told me a story that there's this like you know warhammer mm. there's supposed to be a place in warhammer because in what in the warhammer 40,000 or 40k world it's like the far future where technology has become sort of incomprehensible to people so it's understood as religion or magic so mm-hmm. they have all this like super duper advanced technology, but they don't really know how it works. So they think that they need like priests on their ships to say prayers in order to fly into space. Yeah. They've ritualized it. Anyway, there's this place where there's an old portal that is a universal translator and there's a mm-hmm. town around it. And the portal keeps working, even though no one knows how it works. And anyone who goes there can immediately understand anyone else. Mm-hmm. My question is... What happens if you're born there? Do you- we, we have had this as a question. <laughs> Didn't we tackle this one? Somebody Maybe asked this did. once in a mailbag. So what if you're born there and yeah. the thinking is essentially your first language? Does it read your thoughts? Or if you speak a certain different way from standard, whatever the language is, will it... Yeah. Do the equivalent in the in the target language, or is it reading your thoughts and giving you what the example that we had was? What if you don't know the word for something and you say um, defenestration? The word defenestration has been coming up a lot. For those who don't know, it means to throw someone out a window. Right. What if you don't know what defenestration is, and then it's like, oh, I defenestrated Tom the other day, and they don't know what that is. What do they hear? Do they hear the equivalent of defenestrated yeah. or do they hear the equivalent of threw somebody out of a window? You know, what what does the universal translator do? Is it reading thoughts or is it just translating things straight? Well, it it depends what sci-fi you're reading. Because in right, Star yeah. Trek, but again, the story keeps changing because in the original series they said, oh, it takes brain waves and then translates them. Because in one episode they found this like flashing rock which the Universal Translator was really struggling with the flashing rock, and then eventually it managed to translate it, and it was calling the crew um, giant bags of... Uh, uh, yeah! Giant bags Fluid. of ugly water or something. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we uh, mean which, is true. yeah which is true. Which is true. But then the explanation was, was that it was giving off brainwaves, which could be translated but in farscape the way that universal translation works in farscape is that there's this bacteria that attaches itself to people's brain stems and it translates incoming messages but it doesn't affect your whether you can speak other people's languages so in that yeah. scenario that's the same as babel fishes yeah yeah so in that scenario i suppose you'd have to have a native language before it would work right Mm. yeah the question i guess is like is it distributed like telepathy or is it translating two languages to each other yeah which a lot of sci-fi authors aren't always clear about yeah because universal translators are basically used in science fiction as a tool to get rid of the problem of thinking about really interesting (laughs) linguistic questions exactly (laughs) And it's it's so persuasive, like, uh, for example, in Star Trek, which, of course, we're going to talk about a lot because they've done so many things, like uh, Jean-Luc Picard, who is canonically French, mm-hmm. uh, goes to France and yeah. sits down with his family and his brother. And they all continue to speak English, not even with a French accent. And it's just like... I don't know. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Like, the reason why the Universal Translators in so many sci-fi movies is because they want to have a show in English. Yeah, because Jean-Luc Picard is canonically speaking French the whole time to everyone. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and the yeah, show no, ruins so- that. <laughs> yeah. This, this this whole thing just weirds me out. Like, I should his lips should have been moving differently, but instead he speaks English, and the lips move. The lip movements are English. <gasps> Does the Universal then- Translator translate lip movements as well? Does it make me see things differently as well as hear things differently? 
Yeah, because then the aliens uh, would all be having different movements. And I would assume, actually, that most of the aliens wouldn't be even using spoken language because why should they? Mm. Um, yeah. So you, you'd you imagine they should be doing all sorts of things to communicate that would be then translated into your language of choice. Hannah, have you read Becky Chambers? Uh, I started, yeah, the angry pla- is it the small- long a far way to a small angry planet and then there's two more yeah yeah the there's, talk you boxes. can read them any order but they're in the same universe there's a species there that have spoken language and they talk to each other but they have an extra communication channel which is like they they have this part of their face this i think it's on their cheeks that can flash different colors mm-hmm And it can signal, like, if they're being sarcastic or loving or angry or upset or, like, their tone. It's sort of like Mm -hmm. intonation a bit. Or facial expression, Um, really. Yeah. I was thinking, I think faces do that. Mm. But the the characters in the novel kept saying, yeah, you humans think it's, like, facial expression or intonation, but actually it's, like, it's more than that. It's something Mm -hmm. more. Um, And they're like, yeah, yeah, we can speak to you. But, like, we find it weird, but we will – It's it, so it's, like, they don't have a problem with, like, transferring basic information, but they're just, like – it's almost like when when people in sci-fi show talk about, like, ascending in intelligence until you become, like, a god. It's sort of like that. They're, like, yeah, yeah, you guys are using this, like, kindergarten language, fine, and we can communicate with you on that. But, actually, there's this um, other thing going on. Mm-hmm. I thought that was kind of cute. That was more – that was more fun. So what? Are, maybe if we, if we, because I'm gonna keep talking about Star Trek if no one stops me. What are some other fun things that sci-fi authors do? Or maybe we should get back to what you originally started talking about before we went off tangents on Universal Translate, which was how sci-fi authors have influenced linguists. Yeah, because I mean, a lot of thought experiment. I mean, the thing, another thing that comes to mind is Sophia Worf. People talk about that a lot in relationship to yeah. sci-fi. And well, it formed the basis of one very uh, influential sci-fi film about aliens making contact. Arrival. Naturally. You know, than, we, had, yeah. uh, we, we had a thing where we, the team, went to uh, an actual screening of Arrival when it was in, in theaters with some of our listeners and friends Mm -hmm. and then we had a big old chat about it afterwards like why do we like sapir wharf so much the idea that language influences thought but what we came up with was that it's the idea that language influences your thoughts seems kind of magical and Mm -hmm. when you're in the sci-fi world magical is good and we like it it feels magical but it also feels intuitive right i think (laughs) A lot of people yeah. do. Yeah. We, we fight that intuition hard, don't we? As linguists. Well, it's just, so, so in last episode, we were talking about this experiment. Now it's a bit of a party pooper, but it was this experiment where people were counting things. And if they, in their, if, if they didn't have that many numerals in their individual language, they couldn't count as far and do mm-hmm. these counting tasks. And I couldn't help being like, yeah, but maybe that's got nothing to do with whether they have numerals or not. Maybe that has got to do with like how often they count things. Yeah. If you don't count things often, you don't have many numerals and you're not good at counting. That's yeah. right. And there's yeah, no was... reason that it's the language. You know what I mean? I mean, the language is yeah. available. The language could have, the language does have uh, numbers on up to 100, but not everyone uses them. And so if you start making mistakes, it could not be because you don't have the language available. It could just be that that's you, you're in uncharted territory for you. This is not something you do a lot. And yeah, we don't know yeah. how to tease that apart. Do you know what it I mean? It reminds me of um, when I was a kid, my best friend was Hungarian and her family used to take me to Hungary during the summer because they'd go there every summer to, to visit their family and just, oh, nice. just, take, just take me with them. Um, but I was a vegetarian. I still am a vegetarian, but as a child I was. Um, they didn't have a word for vegetarian at the time. Oh, no. um, ah. <laughs> uh, but also, um, I tried, well, I, with my rubbish Hungarian, tried to explain what vegetarianism is. 
and also my friend who is, is speaks Hungarian did ex, tried to explain. But frequently, uh, I would be given things that I would not consider to be uh, part mm-hmm. of a vegetarian diet. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. then I remembered when I was 16, I went and her granddad came running out the house and said, Hannah, Hannah, we've got a word for vegetarian. And I was just like, hallelujah. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. it felt like this magical thing that I could unlock um uh, an explanation of what this diet was because it felt like it was unexplainable to people without the word. But I mm-hmm. know that they, like Hungarians, are capable of conceiving a vegetarian diet and describing one. They have the language to do it. But it felt like the word was the thing. And I think that's just because of the frequency of encountering it as a concept improves your understanding of it in the same way, yeah, what you're saying that um, frequency of um counting to a specific number would improve your ability to uh to count do yeah it. who knows <laughs> yeah. like doing things and encountering things make you have more experience with them yeah yeah but yeah there's loads of sci-fi that that discusses this i mean 1984 is the other obvious example except for arrival where people's thought is restricted by what they can put into language my favorite one is babel 17 oh yeah yeah. Uh, in which not only does it restrict what you can conceive of, but in that one, you can essentially sort of program people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. It's the same thing in Snow Snow Crash, if you've read that by Neil Stevenson. No, I haven't. Um, I have, but I, it was a long time ago. What happens there? So it's in ancient times, there's this people get programmed with this specific language, which almost acts as a virus. And then somebody kind of creates an antivirus software for this language, which enables people like them to free up their thought and ability to have oh. different languages and therefore different thoughts. So it's a play on the, the whole uh, Babel myth where God came down and said, right, I confound your language. You can all, spread across the earth and speak different languages and in the i always think it's funny that in the bible that's framed as like a punishment that god's punishing us yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for trying to reach <laughs> with heaven. language like, diversity yeah exactly <laughs> for the really, sin of cooperation <laughs> in uh, in snow in snow crash it's almost framed like it's a, a free a, a thing that freed us to be able to think more mm. freely and in different ways um which i think is a much nicer frame of it yeah, I like that. It makes you wonder sort of, because maybe I have a basic linguistic relativism anti-stance, um, just because I'm a cynical person who like doesn't believe in neat explanations and it's usually something else. But sometimes it makes me think, you know, I mainly think and speak Swedish and English and they're quite similar. Mm-hmm. And, you know, maybe there is things that I don't think about so much that yeah the other day i i it took me over 24 hours to remember a very particular cultural specific word from my region in sweden Mm. and i felt weird because i knew what the thing was yeah but Mm. yeah it was strange to you yeah it's it's actually it's not a very romantic word it's like if you have a cigarette you smoke half of it and then you put it out and you save Mm -hmm. the other half Mm mm-hmm that has a different word than if it's finished. What is the word for that in English? You don't have one. I don't, yeah, I, don't I guess we not. Have one. You call uh, the thing "butt" like a cigarette butt. Yeah, yeah. that's the end. Maybe it'd just be an, un- an unfinished butt. Yeah. <laughs> do, do we just smoke the whole thing? Is that why we don't have this? But no, like- I think you have equal amount of of poor teenagers, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if not more. If simplest. not more. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, anyway. Uh, but um, but it made me feel like I lost a connection to a world. And then when I thought of it, I was like, oh, yeah. And it felt like you were saying about vegetarianism. Like it felt, it did feel different remembering mm-hmm. the word. Even mm-hmm. though I could conceive of the concept. I feel like we're talking about different things. Lex- like lexically, that feels like one area. But then like having the morphology of your language, like what suffixes you have influence how much money is in your bank account or 
how likely you are to be for equal rights for women or something mm -hmm. like that. It, that that feels like a whole different territory. Feels like we could get behind a bit of Warfianism in the lexicon, but when it comes to the spooky stuff, we go, mm, that's not a thing. Or maybe we go that the whole thing isn't a thing. Well, I think the whole thing's a thing, but only a tiny bit. Is yeah. that's how I feel? That okay. But I don't. But I don't know because it is. Yeah, all of the examples that we've ever had of Warfianism tend to be well, not all of them, because there's the um, ability to intuitively know where north, south, east, and west is, depending on what words you use for directions. And that's a reliable yeah. finding. And that feels a bit Warfian because it's influencing your cognition of the world. Mm -hmm. um, or as a practice, yeah. once again. You know, I, we, we keep hitting this. I, the universe in which its language looks exactly like the universe in which its practice. And I don't know how to separate those two. Yeah, no. it's tricky. Uh, Daniel, in last episode, you also talked about like um, Dutch kids and mm. English kids and counting because Dutch kids and English kids grow up in fairly comparable. But then again, it could be that like in Dutch daycares, they don't practice counting as much as in English daycares. Like, I but don't, the idea I don't was know. that in, in English, we say 24, but in Dutch, they say 420. And they asked the kids to do two digit addition and the English speaking kids did way better. Even mm. accounting for factors like age and education. Right. But why should the order have an effect on that? Because you have to... I mean, now I'm learning German and I'm trying to... It's fear and 20. So if you... Yeah. And then you add two. Is it still the case when you get up to the 80s or 70s? Is it still reversed? Because yeah. if it flips, then that would... Oh, okay. But it's, yeah, yeah. it slips 400, right? Yeah. It's, it's 100. Foot. Yeah. yeah. 100 fear and 20. So then it would be yeah. Yeah, 1, 4, 2 rather than one, two, four. Yeah. For 124. Yeah, that's the same in German. I keep getting this question about what would alien languages be like? And yeah. I'm sure that you've got a lot of reading on that. And I keep thinking, well, okay, we don't know what their language would be like, but we can take some guesses as to based on what communication must be like. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, they'd probably keep their adjectives and their nouns pretty close together. They'd say either red house or house red, but they, if they had those things, they probably wouldn't say house, blah, 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 red, because that, from an information theoretic perspective, that makes it easier. And, and what I get back is, well, what if they have super good working memory? Then it's not a problem. Oh, dang it. Okay, so another language doesn't have to... I guess my assumption about that was probably wrong based on that assumption. I mean, we yeah. even have human languages that do that, right? Yes. Well, both of Australian do indigenous languages do discontinuous numerals where they have the uh, – noun phrases where they have the adjective intersecting, like not in the same phrase as the noun. There's uh, been some work on long-distance dependencies, but, yeah, that could totally be uh, something that happens. Yeah. What do you think, Hannah? Yeah, because it's really, really unsatisfying to say they could literally look like anything. Um, yeah, it is. <laughs> I, I really, I try to avoid saying that whenever I can. Um, but quite, and, and I find that quite a lot of the discourse around what can, what assumptions can we make about uh, language universally, uh, including alien ones, all of it seems a little bit like it's justifying the choices that science fiction authors have made to say that we can assume that they probably have words for cooperation and war and peace and these concepts that we think of as being as as concepts that you would necessarily have to have in order to have uh, a sufficiently intelligent um uh species to um negotiate a language but also negotiate space space travel assuming that um, you'd need space travel for us to ever find them and and speak to them. There's even insane assumptions. There's like an original series Star Trek episode where they, which they later contradict, where they say that masculine and feminine are universal mm -hmm. concepts. Yeah. Because uh, they encountered this oh. like sentient gas cloud and Kirk is like, ooh, this is a woman. <laughs> 
Uh, of course, of <laughs> course. Not only Kirk. is it a woman, but it's also a heterosexual woman who is in love with uh, a human who man. Makes out with him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because, <laughs> like, because I find the ones that you said now, now, Hannah, like conflict corporation, I find more plausible than masculine feminine. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because mm. even looking at the species on Earth, that you find loads of animals that that um, have, uh, well, no binary sex or very fluid binary sex that you can like even amongst insects and things that can change sex and do all sorts of fancy things. Or oh, among um, humans, yeah, and among humans. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's fun. You wouldn't need to have a word for war or you, the concept war. For example, you had groups of people with limited telepathy. So wars happen, among other reasons, when we're not sure what somebody's going to do, but we think that they might be hostile. Mm. So we prepare, we prepare for war. If you had limited telepathy and I could see that you had good intentions toward me, but not much else or I could feel that you had bad intentions toward me, then I could take the appropriate action. So that all a language where it's impossible to lie, like in Embassy Town. Um, mm. Oh, tell me about that one. Well, so there's a, a, there's a concept of language in Embassy Town, which is just stylized with a capital L, where you it's impossible to lie. Mm. So it's just basically like telepathy that you externalize. Can you choose to not say things? Yeah. But even right. within fiction where they have telepathy and you can... So like in uh, Chaos Walking by Patrick Ness, which is a, f a film now, the characters can see each other's thoughts and it's called noise or hear it, experience each other's noise. But that you can control your noise, right? Some people are better at it than others. But it's a really weird concept like to have telepathy without, a con without the ability to control it that... You just, who would be able to cope? But that's the other thing. It's like when we talked about the conflict and cooperation, what if, you know, the other species live in a hive corporation, Borg-like community mm -hmm. where there's no word for war or cooperation really because within the community, you never have any conflict. No one ever has any bad intentions towards each other. Mm -hmm. And if you encounter someone who is not of your community – you famously try to make them part of your community because that's the only way you understand the world. Then you wouldn't have, re like, I don't think the Borg really have a word for, they have a word for like resistance, which is famously futile. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I'm not sure they have a word for war or invasion or anything like that because. If only we could ask them. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but would we understand? Mm. Mm. Well. I guess we would with Universal Translator. So tell me about the chapters in the book. What, uh, mm. How have you divided this up so far? So I divided it up into three parts. The first part is all about our evolutionary past and biology. So we go through animal communication systems, different modalities for communication and what they look like, the genetic basis for language and the X-Men theory of language and whether it all came about at once as a result of one mutation or whether it was small incremental steps. Ooh, I know this one. <laughs> <laughs> and also about um, neurology and the brain. And the middle section's all about culture and language contact, language diversity, language change, and how things are changing now in present day uh, human languages and what we know about them. And then the last part is all about the future and linguistic technologies and where they're going and what science fiction can uh, teach us about that. Mm. Yeah. That sounds a good division. Good plan for a book. Yeah. I want to ask one more question. Um, you are a linguist. You are also a science communicator. Mm -hmm. What's the right way to do linguistics communication? <laughs> or if there's no right way because it's individualized, then, you know, what good things have you noticed people doing? What should everyone be emulating? Um, so I think it depends massively on what your objectives are. So okay. there's actually, I just wrote a, um, a chapter for a book that's coming about, about linguistics and public engagement, published by Routledge, edited by Hazel Price and Dan McIntyre, who's at Huddersfield. And there's loads and loads of lovely examples in that. So every chapter is another example of, of 
um, some project that people are doing. But I wrote uh, one of the earlier chapters, which is very, very broad and about this question of what, what makes good linguistic communication or research mm. communication about linguistics. And then I'm just talking about how you boil down, working out what your objective is, which audiences does your objective relate to, and how can you go about reaching that audience where they're at? Because I think that the mistake that a lot of people make is uh, trying to do things for the general public and they start too broad. But of course, the general public Hmm. is made up of three-year-olds, 90-year-olds. It's made up of your nan and your nephew and um, somebody that you've never met on the other side of the world who likes completely different things to you. Yeah. And so as long as you're being honest with yourself about who you're reaching, because I imagine because language reaches linguistics nerds, right? That's who listens yeah. to it. That's who signs up to the Patreon. It's people like me who really, really love linguistics and want to hear about linguistics. And you engage them with discussions about that. But people who don't know what linguistics is are very unlikely to find your podcast and listen to it. People who Mm -hmm. know what it is, but they just could not care less. They would not listen to it either. And that's fine, right? That's totally fine. I really, really like initiatives that embed research communication into culture. So... I, the, I think the reason I really, really got into this science fiction thing is because science fiction is part of culture, right? And it has a huge nerdy following, but I think that this nerdy following is is getting bigger and bigger. All of the kind of uh, top ranking films of the of the past year or for the last 10 years, the top ones are all science fiction. They're all Marvels, superhero films, um, big blockbuster science fiction, right? And and I think people often think sci-fi is really niche and nerdy. It's so not. And and also sci-fi nerds think it is, and they're like, oh, we're like the underdog of culture. And it's like, have you seen what movies are raking in money? Yeah, yeah. You're not a minority. So I think it's a really nice, because it's so mainstream and there's so many people interested in it, it's such a nice vehicle to t- to start these conversations about linguistic research by kind of saying, right, what's behind the linguistics of Star-, Star Trek, of Star Wars, of the Marvel films, of Arrival. But there's lots of to be said even about the ones that aren't the obvious ones like Arrival. So yeah, I think... That was a very long-winded but broad answer. (laughs) No, I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. And I think in general, not only when it comes to science communication, but overall in a lot of things you do in life in general, it's good to truly understand who your audience, who you're speaking to. That goes Mm -hmm. for like a dialogue you just have with one other person too when I write code. So like when I write our code, I try and think about like, is it me who's going to use it a year from now or is it someone else? And how does that uh, make a difference? And also scientific articles you write for different journals or different audiences. It's always good. And you're right, like in our podcast, we think that our audience and we do service of our audience and we mm-hmm. know that they have a certain amount of linguistics knowledge usually already. They might not mm-hmm. know all the terms or all the latest things and that's fine. Why would they? Why would we? You know? Um, but yeah, we do start from a certain place. And I think I think that's really good good advice generally for communication. Communication broadly. Any communication. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Little, what is something that you want our audience to know about the future of language? What I, well, what I want people to know about the future of... I don't know, because I think um, one interesting thing... Because we were talking about universal translators at the beginning which I think is where the really interesting space is, because I think it kind of gets to this question you had about how would you learn language in this instance of there being a a present, the presence of a universal translator and whether Mm. the future of language, people ask this a lot, whether the future of language is that we all just end up speaking the same language or if universal translator would facilitate further diversification of language because it would reduce the need to have people being multilingual and also um, speaking different languages with different people because you just the computer would do it all for you. Mm-hmm. 
You can just speak your own individual Goku Gaga, essentially. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's a really interesting question. Makes you very sensitive. So if the, if the Romulans, the Martians or whatever, mm-hmm. knock out your universal translator, or spread yeah. a virus that kills the babel fish or the bacteria or whatever, yeah. you're sort of fucked. Yeah. And not all science fiction shows resolve the issue of um, people needing to understand each other via something like a universal translator. So The Expanse has Delta Creole, where, so in the belt, which is the outer regions of the solar system where a lot of people live, called the Belters, um, but they all come from different parts of Earth and Mars, and so they need a universal language. Well, just like Creoles come about in, in the real world. Um, they need a language yeah. to be able to communicate with each other for purposes of trade and things. So they have they have Belta Creole, which I think is mm. a much more elegant and realistic solution in that universe than just kind of having either a kind of universal lingua franca or a common tongue, which is another a frequent trope that you, you see in science fiction where everybody just speaks English. All of these lingua francas always look exactly like English which is mm-hmm. quite serendipitous. Um, yeah, instead you'd have, you'd have something that's, that's a functional language that facilitates this, well, these language contact situations. Yeah, I think in terms of human future, if we don't factor in aliens, mm-hmm. that is much more realistic. I agree. Dr. Handel Little, thanks for being with us. How can people find out what you're doing? You can go to my website, itchlittle.com. But I'm also on Twitter at Hanachronism, which is spelled with an H and then the word anachronism, uh, which is not how you spell Hannah. But yeah, you'll be able to find me. <laughs> Very good. We'll have a link on our website, becauselanguage.com. Now we're to the words of the week. And we got a bunch. The first one suggested by Diego. Guess what this is? Red COVID. Oh, tell me it's not another variant. I really don't want it to be another variant. <laughs> when I saw this, I thought, I don't know what this is, but I'm not going to like it. Yeah, yeah, this is this bodes ill. No, it's not a new variant of COVID. Okay, good. Is it? We'll what get it? those anyway. Is it like Red October, Red COVID somehow? Not related to Red October. Okay. Oh, hang on. Is it related to the Republican Party somehow? Why, yes, it is. Okay. So red is their color. Um, red COVID is, is, oh, okay. Is this to do with the general fatigue people are experiencing around Republican bullshit? You're hitting around it here. Okay. Diego has pointed us to an article by Eric Ting in sfgate.com. This refers to the way that deaths from COVID are correlated county by county in California to voting tendencies and one presumes how Republican a county oh. is. The Republican voting ones or the red ones are suffering way more excess deaths than the Democratic leaning ones. Okay. I mean unsurprisingly. That yeah, that that intuitively makes sense given all of the rampant and here's the thing, not just anti vax, but also anti mask and all of the other like anti closure, all of the other protective mm. factors that were being rolled out and potentially still could be rolled out. Yeah, I guess that makes a horrible, morbid sort of sense. Now, we on Because Language have a very strong policy that nobody should ever die for any reason, ever, ever, ever. Immortality for all, obviously. Do you know that someone has not that opinion? <laughs> really? What? Well, so- Someone doesn't believe immortality for all? Wow, spicy take. You know Bolsonaro? Who? Bolsonaro. Oh, Brazilian. yeah, the leader of Brazil. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the trippy yes. guy. He said in interviews, apparently, that, like, we shouldn't be scared of death and, like, it's fine to die and, like, COVID yeah. and stuff aren't really problems because strong people don't die and people who die, it's fine. He's just a pure fascism. For those who have never encountered this man, he is... He is a level of crank that is pretty rare to come across. Like, he is willing to say things out loud. To 
just bizarre. He like this is the same guy who said things like, "I would rather my son die in a car accident than be gay." He said that yeah. openly, mm-hmm. publicly, mm-hmm. at like a stump speech. Like this mm-hmm. dude is off the chain. He's also said that like that one of the problems with the military junta that was before in Brazil was that like they didn't kill enough people. Yeah, they didn't go far yeah. enough. Mm. Oh. Death culture is so weird. Yeah, it seems that before the vaccine was available, there wasn't much of a difference. And in fact, remember that the Trump administration was happy to do nothing about COVID because they thought it would attack mm. blue state cities most heavily. For a while, there wasn't really any correlation between political inclination in the U.S. counties and COVID deaths. But Eric Ting reports that after the vaccine became widely available, it very strongly skewed toward Trump won counties versus Biden Uh, won counties. There we go. I mean, that's awful and terrible. And I'm unlike the Queen, where I was willing to go pretty hard. This is just a situation where all these people dying fucking sucks and there have been people who could have prevented a lot of that and for their own political gain decided to just sow dissent and disinformation and division rather than just try and save people's lives and those people should be fucking shot into the sun basically but the people in these counties who have died because people gave them bad information and because of like echo chambers and all the rest of the stupid bullshit that we have at the moment. That's really sad. And I'm really bummed out about that. Yeah, I've been wrong before. And it really sucks that this time the consequences for being wrong is dying. Because, you know, in the end, we're really all in this together, even if they might not think so. Yeah, it's really fucked. Okay, so Red COVID. We've got two more here. Uh, Diginim and Wi-Fi tribe. Diginom. Digin- oh, did I Digin- write Digi? Nom? Yeah, it's supposed to be Diginom. Do you want to guess what Diginom is? <sighs> is it is it fucking tragic that the only thing I can think of now that you've said Diginom is Digimon? Of course, yeah. <laughs> is that, yeah. Is that the That's thing why it's ever? funny, but it's it's not dig- so it's- Digital Monsters. Yeah, it's not that. My son was digging through all his old crap in his room yesterday and he found all these Yu-Gi-Oh cards, so of course Digimon Ooh. is all I can think of. Um, Diginom, okay, I'm assuming it's to do with virtually eating? No, so it's the kind of person. Oh, it's not nom. Oh, okay. I want to look at that backwards and say it's manigid, but that's not right. Okay. Pull it a bullet in this. Tell us what it is. Digital nomad. Uh, so huh. um, okay. the more common word is digital nomad, um, but a funny comedian I like likes to say diginom, and I think that's very funny. Uh, Ina Lundström. Do you know what? I, I would go with diginome because it's got that kind of like gnome oh, yeah. like vibe. That's that's true. <laughs> so digital nomad is a word describing people who choose to be without a stable home and to travel around and to work remotely and go from new places to new places. It's an interesting phenomenon. And there is uh, an association slash company, I don't know exactly, called Wi-Fi Tribe, where people who are digital nomads like go to places together and travel together and like find each other. And they call that a Wi-Fi tribe. I'm a little bit unclear exactly what it takes to be a Wi-Fi tribe. Uh, I looked at their website and I didn't necessarily understand more. Um, But yeah, it's a thing a lot of people do. So it's taking work from home to a new level. Yeah. Work from no home. Some people really like it. What was the film with Francis McDormand about this kind of? Yeah. On the best picture, um, I thought it was called Nomad because what I was going to say is basically um, Mick Dorman. Um, this is one of those things that, like, if you've got money, this is really cool, and if you don't, you're a feckless homeless beggar yeah. kind of thing. Like, it's it's unfortunate and a bit Nomad Land is what I was thinking of. Sorry. Okay. Oh, that's right. Um, because if you watch Nomad Land, it's in my queue. Um, you will see a, a, a exactly what you've just described, right? A community of, like, alternatively homed people and they would regularly get together for, like, big meetups where they share information and, and, and tips and tricks and all that kind of stuff. But one of the things that I think that film does a very good job of showing is how unsafe in, in ways beyond simply physical safety a, a life like that can be. Yeah. Um, so I'm just a little bit wary of, like, the insta van life people being like oh, yeah. oh, hashtag blessed and because that's because that's essentially what we're talking about yeah. right is this like 
kind of create a culture who then go on the move. Now, that's not to say I'm sure there's probably like, I don't know, coders, for instance, out there who can just do their work wherever the fuck there is a computer and internet access. There's a lot of people, I think, who can do that. The The question and why I thought it was interesting when I heard about Wi-Fi Tribe is that like they recognize that only having interactions through digital medium is not enough and they they need yes. to meet up yeah, yeah, yeah. persons. Um, they choose to meet up certain kinds of people in these spaces because as far as I understand, these Wi-Fi Tribe uh, events and, and trips are, they meet each other in real life, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's it's a very privileged position to be in and it can still be very unsafe. Um, I think it also says something about, because they're digital nomads in that they're physically homeless, but I think a lot of them would describe maybe they're like them having a village online. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Like you still have a home. Oh. It's just not physical. Um, there was... Uh- a wonderful episode of the sitcom My Name is Earl, which if you've never seen it, basically every episode is Earl, the titular character, trying to right one sort of wrong that he's done to someone in his life. He's trying to be a better person. And in this particular episode, he tries to right a wrong with a guy, but he can't do it because the guy dies the day before he like goes to like apologize and make amends and stuff. And what they so what he does is he goes, okay, I'm going to have to put on a really good like funeral for this guy that's how i'm going to make amends kind of thing that's oh, okay. the best i can do and he finds out that this person has no one in his life right like 3 oh. quarters of the episode is him just desperately trying to find anyone family friends and he can't find anyone and then right at the end he like nudges this dude's computer and it goes like bling 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 and he sees all these messages from people like, where are you, man? What's happened? What's going on? And it was just a really lovely kind of reminder that some people find yeah. their world, their tribe in other ways. Yeah. It reminds me of The Grapes of Wrath, how this family is reduced to ashes and scattered to the winds. And out of that chaos, new relationships emerge. And it's a painful transformation of society and culture, but society and culture can be very robust. Okay, fine, Daniel. I did a sitcom. You did high literature. We get it. You're very smart. <laughs> I haven't read it for a while. But as as a person who has chosen to go into academia at least for a while, um, this is a problem that I face. Like I'm a, a un unwillingly sort of a digital nobody in some ways. I don't like it. Mm-hmm. Um, I make friends with people like you guys and I go and see you or I see friends at conferences and I don't like that my village is spread out across the world. It's Mm. actually something that makes me like not want to do my be in this industry at all. So is that, is that, and here's us bringing it back to linguistics. Is that something that's kind of relatively, certainly not only for linguistics, but for kinds of study that are not going to have like a, a department at a university? Because I have to imagine, say, the, I don't know, the business department, right, probably has a staff of like 20 or 30 academics working concurrently. Do you no, have any, acad- how many linguistic? It's acad- across the entire university. Precarity is across, it's even across into non-academia kinds of labor that you get when you're choosing yeah, right. these kinds of topics. Um, casualization of the workforce and like it's universities don't value like if you get a permanent position opening up and you've had someone that you've casually employed for five years, they still need to compete with people from outside the university and yeah, their okay. experience within the mm. university system doesn't count for anything. Um, no, it's really bad all around. When it was presented to me, it was like, yeah, well, you'll you'll finish your PhD and then you'll do a number of postdocs and you'll go around the world wherever you can and then you'll have to fight for a full time position one day. And- yeah, that's it. Wow, it was just it was just miles away from what I wanted to do being an established person and I that that was one thing that made me realize, oh, okay, this is not gonna be me. Yeah. Um and I have immense respect for anybody who can do it. Like I don't know. You, Hedvig, and my I don't other know, friends respect the word it. that you need to say there. <laughs> but it is. I mean being being able to have that skill to be able to market yourself anywhere in the world and that needs you. It's amazing. Yeah. Um Let's go on to, I'm sorry, let's go on to our last one. This one comes from Colleen on our Discord. Justifiably, there's been some pushback on quiet quitting. Quiet quitting is that kind of awful term about just doing your job, not 
busting your not uh not letting work invade your life a giving into grind culture yeah um acting their wage acting your wage mm, like a good that. alternative to quiet quitting and it's a reference to Sarai Marie, a TikToker who's created a character called Valerie who uh, oh, doesn't take She's any done. nonsense. Have you yeah. seen this? This is the girl with the giant Starbucks cup. That's the one. Should we yep. play some audio? Absolutely. Veronica, did you just decline the Zoom meeting that's at 6.30 tonight? Oh, yeah, I did. I did do that. Yeah, because it's outside of my working hours, 9 to 5, so I won't be attending. Okay, Veronica, I'm going to need you to complete all of this today. Susan, do I look like two people to you? No. Oh, okay. Just making sure. Because that looks like the work of two people, right? Right? And I'm one. I'm just one person, right? There's a, I saw a great stitch to one of, is it Veronica? Yeah. Yeah. So I saw a great stitch to this, which was basically some like super sketchy looking, like punk anarchist type person, <laughs> like <laughs> septum nose piercing, mohawk, all the rest of it. And, and this, this, I, I don't even know if this person identifies as female, but they were certainly um, AFAB presenting, basically went, um, I, I wonder how it feels to all of the, like, edgy Marxist boys with a podcast to know that the boss is single-handedly doing more <laughs> to, like, to radicalise people than they will ever achieve in their entire <laughs> lives. And I was like, point. that's so accurate. Wow. It's so yeah. true. There are several TikTok accounts in this genre. I, I want to have a good name for the... I've, I've accidentally stumbled into what I would call HR talk, uh, <laughs> yeah. like human resources yeah. TikTok. Uh, yeah. Which has a like lot of these creators. Human resource role play talk. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot. Oh, right. There's like people who have bosses who are like supposed to try and be cool, um, and like, oh, I'll sign your extension for your contract next week. We're friends, aren't we? And that kind of. I've also, do you know what I've come across as well is actual HR representatives who are just flaming other people, but like in really appropriate ways. Oh yeah. Because a lot, I I think much like politician HR cops a lot of hatred from people for being like the stick in the muds, the boring people, all that kind of stuff. But a lot of the a lot of the people in on TikTok who are talking about HR are like, we're the people making sure that like good process is followed. Mm. Like they'll role play a boss being like, like almost like Michael from the office. Like we don't have cause to fire this person. And the boss is like, but because I hate them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've seen those too. Or like, but she's pregnant. We can't fire people because they're pregnant. Mm. Or like, <laughs> you, people keep quitting my team. I don't understand. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you. <laughs> well, there is one common factor here. There is one common here. factor here. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny. Okay, so as entertaining as us talking about TikToks <laughs> that we've seen, I'm sure <laughs> is to our listening audience, we should probably yeah, move probably. on. Okay, well, that's about it. So, Red COVID, Digionom, Wi-Fi Tribe, and Acting Your Wage. There are words of the week. We've got some comments about ew, because we had the mailbag of ew, and we wondered, are there any words in other languages where you use ew or something like it? So, this one's from Dax at Speech Docs. Hello, you're listening to us right now. Yes, they do our transcripts and they do a great job. A message for Ben, says Dax. Oh. I'm currently on book two of the Expanse series oh. by James Corey and enjoying them immensely, but I will get to Warhammer 40k after this. Oh, mate, they're so good. You are going to froth on these bad boys and they're all out. Can I make a recommendation? Actually, can I really quickly pass the mic to Hedvig to make a recommendation? Because she made a recommendation to me and I am now, like, I smashed through the four books that I could. Hedvig, you go. The Steerswoman. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good. I love it. The Sorry. The Steers Woman by Rosemary Kirsten. It's the best. Oh, awesome. You you read all four. Yeah. So What did you yes. think? Well, I'm halfway through book four. Okay. Oh my god. Okay. Hmm. I have a pretty good guess of what's going on. We can talk about it in a sec, because I know Daniel will never okay. read it. Let's talk about I it in a sec. Might. So anyway, Dax, the Steers Woman series is Oh, good. If you ever thought to yourself, hey, I wonder if academics could be like sword wielding heroes of a story who like love truth and knowledge, <laughs> my friend, is there a series for you? Oh, it's so good. <laughs> so good linguistic okay, stuff. So, as what well. do you actually have to say about ooh? Dex continues. And also, as a fan of the series, and to answer your question on 
you in other languages. In Telugu, we use tu. Now, I'm not sure if that's aspirated T, tu, tu, or thu, T H O O. I should know this. I guess this is used in other South Indian languages as well, but cannot testify completely to that. And that does sound like an ejective, doesn't it? Tu, tu, spitting something out. Yes, yeah, you're like tu, tu. Yeah. Cameron on Patreon says, I was fascinated by your discussion about you. As a millennial American, I have always used it, and I am not a valley girl, and I had no idea it was so recent. Anyway, I wanted to add that Wolof, mostly spoken in Senegal and the Gambia, does have a similar exclamation, Jim. Ah. As far as I know, it's only used as an exclamation and not in a sentence. It is mostly used in the same way one might exclaim, gross, and can be used to express disgust or displeasure with other things too, like a politician. Oh, that guy's gross. In the same way that an American might say, ew, about some horrible thing a Republican did. Okay. So, Wolof has Jim. Huh. I was just going to make the theory that they all had to end in vowels. Screw <clears throat> me. Oh, nope. darn. Nasals are basically <laughs> vowels. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the, the and, next, that's, and that's the, the, the kind next of thing. academic rigor people come here for. <laughs> you fudge it a little bit and a nasal is the other close. Yeah, you know, it's not like it's, uh, you know, approximate, but it's a nasal. It's close. Yeah. It's close. Big thanks to our guest for this episode, Dr. Hannah Little. Thanks to everyone who gave us ideas for the show. Thanks to Dustin of Sandman Stories, who is still recommending us to nearly everyone. Thanks to the team at Speech Docs, who transcribes our every word. Thanks to our sponsors, the Oxford English Dictionary. And most of all, thanks to our patrons who give us so much support and make it possible to keep the show going. Uh, and Ben and Hedvig, thank you for being here as well. You're welcome. Hey, everybody. If you like the show, there are a number of things that you can do to help. What are they, you ask? Well, we'll tell you a few. Number one, you can send us ideas and feedback. And how do you do that? Well, you can follow us. We're Because Lang Pod everywhere, except Spotify. You can leave us a message with SpeakPipe, but make sure you listen back to your message because I've gotten some not very good audio that I can't use. Ozzy, send it again. You can do that on our website, becauselanguage.com. You can also send us an email. Hello at becauselanguage.com. Or you can tell a friend about us or leave a review. Hey, guys, we have a new review. Yay! You're going to read it. <laughs> Yay. Here we go. This is uh, from Nathaniel via Apple Podcasts. Nathaniel says, love the show. That's six O's. So that's a lot. A lot of love. Iconically speaking. Yeah. Five stars. And then the comment, yes. <laughs> that's it. Simple. That's all it Clear. takes. It's just you, you don't have to, to do point. very much. Love it. That counts. Hedvig. What's another way that people can support the show? Um, oh, uh, there are lots of ways, but I also wanted to add that uh, if you don't use iTunes, Apple, there are other places you can review podcasts online that are good. Um, we can link to some of them. I've done that sure. before. Uh, because meh, iTunes. Uh, you can become a patron on Patreon. Um, that'll entitle you to a bunch of extra stuff like bonus episodes, uh, hanging out with us on Discord, and also just the the warm fuzzy feeling in your stomach knowing that you make it possible for us to do great things like transcripts buy me a boom mic thing uh and other good things so mm -hmm. i want to give a shout out to our top patrons they are dustin termi elias matt whitney chris l helen udo jack barracat lord mortis grammar yen larry christopher andy b james nigel meredith hate nasrin Aisha, Moe, Steele, Manu, Roger, Rianne, Helene, Ignacio, Sonic Snedgehog, Heaven, Jeff, Andy from Logophilias, Stan, Kathy, Rosh, Cheyenne, Felicity, Amir, Kenny Archer, Otim, Alyssa, and Chris W. And the lovely Kate B who smashed the one-time donation button on our website, becauselanguage.com, and who I got to see in Canberra really recently which is very nice. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, and a special welcome to our newest patron. At the listening level, we have Vanya Molotov, Melody, Gordon, B word for the, we weird for words. Is that supposed to be weird for words? I think it's weird for words. Weird for words, but weird is spelled with a Y. And at the friend level, SCW. I'm very curious about that. Thanks to all of our amazing patrons. Satan's Cunning Whispers. That's what I choose to believe that stands for. It's probably like... Maybe it's something really boring, like uh, strawberry chocolate whipped cream. I was going to say it's going to be like Steve Kevin Worcester. 
Okay, a Kevin with yeah. a C is deeply, deeply frightening to me, and it's so what? much worse than my satanic stuff. Is that because of Skinny Puppy? Because one of the numbers <laughs> there was Kevin with a C. Oh, it's just, I don't know, just immediately, no. I, like, I just, yes. mm-mm, Kevin with a C Skinny Puppy bad. owns you. Skinny Puppy owns your soul. Uh. Our theme music has been written and performed by Drew Kraplianov, who's a member of Ryan Bino and Didian's Bible. Thank you for listening. We will catch you next time because language. Yay! You guys are awesome. Thank you. So it sounds like we have uh, stickers. The mystery animators working on a chibi version of us. Is that right? Yes. We've been talking on uh, Twitter DMs of all places because they keep posting like, oh, my commissions are open. And I was like, maybe we should like actually do it. Do it. Let's commit. I tried to like filter the information you guys are talking about back to them. And they were like, yeah, yeah I get I get the, the gist. Something that can scale. And they even suggested like uh, making a couple of small ones that can be used for uh, emoji stickers on Patreon. Oh, nice. Yeah. Good. Uh, I'm working on the postcards. It'll just be stills of us from last weekend. Fair enough. Please, just whatever you do, not that horrendous photo of us doing the heart. Like, what do you that mean? Was, woof. That was really cute. That's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> not only did we get a lot of people online talking about how wronged you in particular were, Hedvig, but... Like, I got people offline doing it as well. Like, I sh- literally rolled over in bed and was like, how did you allow this out? Take it down. And I had to say, well, like, that was her. She she put it up. Yeah. <laughs> what? I, I'm, I'm having trouble seeing the problem. <laughs> well, tell you what, I think we need to move on. Can we save the, what's the Duolingo update? Is that a quick one? It's very quick. Uh, Duolingo made an update and everyone's upset. Okay. Why? You can't go back. Like, they've made, like, a unidirectional skill tree, and people can't work on more than one oh. lesson at one time. Oh. And everyone... Gee, I wonder why. why. Yeah. Have they articulated why? I don't know. I just saw they made the update, and then I saw everyone getting upset, and I thought, it's news. <laughs> <laughs> okay, to our news. listeners who, are, who now have questions, you have no further information. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Okay, I'm, you're the journalist. Right. I'm, I'm the... Top, top line. Mm, thank yeah, you. the mentoring okay. starts now. This is bad. Adding value. <laughs> this, is, yep. this is not good. Uh, no, anyway, um, if anyone finds out why they've done it, um, it seems like bad. Yeah, this is my traditional mug. It's from a bookstore called Atticus, and it's you can see the logo here. It's got a mockingbird. Oh, nice. It's, That's a good cup. And I, I think of Atticus as my model as a father, so... Oh wow! Atticus yeah, Finch. Well, I mean, it's a bit of—it's a bit of a cheat, though, right? Because he's just like the god character, right? He's it's the like, Mary Sue, isn't he? It's—it's it's like saying like the Doctor is my model for a, yeah, okay, some sort of like infinitely capable human who in no way bears any relation to actual creatures. But if I can get seventy percent there, I win. <laughs> yeah, fair enough.